Good morning. Good morning. I want to share with you um, a couple of praise reports. Um, some of you may know about, actually some of you may know about both of these, but uh, our, our missionary family to Belize, the Kidders, uh, a year and a half ago they were in a car accident. They were actually hit by a police officer. Um, they had to wait for an extended period of time, I mean like almost a year, for the police report to come through. Um, their house was raided by the police in the hopes of finding something to prove it was their fault and not the police officer's fault. Um, the police report finally came back that uh, it was the police officer's fault, not their fault, and then they submitted everything to the insurance, and the insurance took another seven, eight months to come to a decision. Well, a week or so ago, we heard that the insurance had decided that even though the police report showed it was not their fault, the insurance believed it, that they were at fault, so they were not going to settle, and they were just out the vehicle. Um, on his way home from the meeting with the insurance people, uh, Mike just happened to see a uh, minivan for sale. Now, for those of you that don't know, Mike and Cindy have three children of their own. Their oldest, Leanne, is here in Montana, but Ashley and Nick are with them. They have four adoptees uh, that they are taking care of. They are in the process of legalizing the adoption for these four uh, children from one family. Uh, their mother was a drug addict. These kids pretty much raised themselves. Uh, Mike and Cindy have taken them in. Uh, they are trying to give them structure. Uh, when you have somebody that you know is nine, ten years old and has never had structure in their life, that that can lead to a lot of conflict. So. Uh, all they had was this little vehicle, and, and every time they'd have to go somewhere, they'd have to take two trips. Well, they found this minivan for a really good price. Uh, there were some mechanical problems, but Mike was able to fix the mechanical problems, and he found out from the insurance that they were willing to pay half of the cost of fixing the new vehicle. So there's our first praise report, because not only do Mike and Cindy now have a vehicle, um, but the insurance completely did a 180 and, and is helping them fix the vehicle so that they can take everybody in one trip. So praise number one. Praise number two, last week we had, uh, I shared with you uh, the McDaniels, who are our missionaries down to Topeka, Mexico. Um, they had asked for prayer right before church on Sunday for a, um, housing. Um, they had gone, I, I talked with Kevin on Monday, uh, they had gone and they would looked at a couple houses. They found one that was perfect. It was within half a mile of the orphanage where they'll be working so they could walk to work if they needed to. Um, the price was incredible uh, for the place it was located. It was just uh, incredible. They talked with the owner. The owner said he'd be willing to rent to them. Uh, they were going to get together the next day to sign papers. The next day they get a message from the owner. Oh, somebody's decided to buy the house, so I'm selling it. I can't rent it to you. Well, they went out, they looked at a couple other places. Uh, the rent was significantly higher. The quality of the house was significantly lower. Um, they just said, okay, God, well, you're just going to have to show us where you want us to go. So he sends out the prayer request, please pray for housing. So we just know what we would need to do. Within an hour of that message going out, they get a phone call from the owner of the first house. The sale fell through and he needs a renter would they be interested in signing a six-month lease so by the time we were out of church last Sunday they had a house so God moves he moves in response to our prayers I use those two cases to show you one of them took a year and a half a little over a year and a half to answer but God answered and in that year and a half, they were not without the means to get where they needed to go. Yeah, it was inconvenient, but they got there. The other one was almost instantaneous. I mean, you're talking between 20 and 60 minutes and poof, there's your answer. God moves. And, and sometimes we got to dig in and we got to be like that persistent widow 
we got to be like that noisome neighbor. Neighbor! Are you up? Neighbor! Neighbor! I've got a visitor! I need some bread! Go away! I'm in bed! My family's in bed! We're trying to sleep! Well, I can fix that. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to dig in and hold on. Okay? So, we have a lot of ground that I'm going to try and cover today. Uh, we're talking about money. Um, this fall, we are going to go through the uh, Dave Ramsey class, the uh, Financial Freedom University. Uh, if you have not been through that, um, I would really encourage you to go through this class. Okay? It is sound financial advice taken from a biblical perspective. Okay? Um, we're talking about money. And I'm not going to ask you for money. Yet. Okay? And I'm, I'm not going to ask you for money at all. Okay? Um, all I'm going to do is relay to you what God has to say about money. And, and I shared with you last week, it's, it's so disappointing to me. Um, depending on, on where you look and how you interpret passages, there are between 2,000 and 2,300 scriptures, verses, dealing with money. Okay? That in some context deal with the issue of money. Eleven of Jesus' parables, 39 parables, 11 of them deal with the issue of money. I think this is a critical issue um, because Jesus said that you cannot serve two masters. You will either love the one and hate the other or vice versa. And he, God understands what a trap money is. So he lays out for us some very clear teaching on money and, and how we're supposed to view it. And, and last week we talked about the first understanding of money is whose is it? God. It's his. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything in it belongs to him. So when you say, you know, look at my car, what you're really saying is, look at the car that God's letting me use. When you say, look at my house, you're saying, look at God's house that he's letting me live in. Okay? We're stewards. We are a people that have been given much, but on a coming day, we will give answer for what we were given and what we did with it. Now, we talked about... Um, Money being a test. I want to give you these points again. Just real quick, I'll run over them. I won't, won't go into the depth that I did last week. Maybe I won't because I can't get the paper off. There we go. Money is a test. Number one, it is a test of your work ethic. We're actually going to go into more depth in this today. Because see, one of the things, um, if, if we eliminate out of those scriptures, those passages that talk about money, for example, um, when the seller of the field said, uh, you know, what is it between us, um, let's say a hundred shekels. Well, that's not instructional scripture about money, it's just talking about money. When it talks about Judas, he betrayed Jesus for what? 30 pieces of silver. Well, that's not instructional verses, and so if we take all of those out, what we're left with about 270, give or take, verses that deal with instruction on how to deal with money. Now, of those 270 some verses, almost a third of them, actually a little bit over a third of them, deal with how you get it. Okay? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Because how you acquire money is important to God. Okay, so the first thing is your work ethic. Money is a test of your work ethic. Are you willing to work? Are you willing to do whatever you can do to earn the money? Okay, so first point. It's a test of our work ethic. Number two, it is a test of your self-control. Are you willing to live within your means?
Is a Pontiac sufficient, or do you have to have the cat? So, it's a test of your worth ethic, it's a test of your self-control. Are you willing to spend less than you bring in? Okay, number three. It is a test of your integrity. How did you get what you have? Did you come by it honestly? Did you cut corners? Did you do stuff under the table? Are you rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's? It's a test of your integrity. Number four, it's a test of your love for people. Have you gone out of your way to help someone when it did absolutely nothing to benefit you? Do you love people enough to give up, um, you know, I, I had a really good example of this in my parents. Uh, my father was saving up, he'd been saving up for actually a number of months to be able to buy tires to put on his truck. This was way back when Christy and I were in college. And um, <clears throat> we were college students, and we had kids, and we had full-time jobs, and we were still college students. I don't recommend that for anyone, okay? The fact that I was in college should indicate that I had some measure of intellect. The fact that I was in college working full-time and had a wife and three kids totally belies that. Okay? And, and things were tight. Um, and my dad, being the man of God that he was, took that money and said, I don't really need tires right now. And he blessed us with that money to be able to take care of things that we needed to take care of. He never said anything to anybody. As a matter of fact, I didn't know about it till later when my mom told me, yeah, that was your dad. That was the money he was saving for his tires, which then made me feel about that big. But that's, that's the, the example that my parents set. Um, so it, it's a test of your love for people. And finally, it's a test of your love for God. Well, looking at this, I gave you two examples of, of men and how they dealt with money. Both of them in the case of the passion of the Christ. The first one being Judas Iscariot. And how even though he was a disciple of Jesus Christ, even though he spent more than three years under the ministry, under the tutelage, under the training of God incarnate, he really had another master, didn't he? The scripture tells us that he had a love for money. And, and you can't love God and love money. And when it came down to it, when he weighed things, he determined that the money was more, more um, appreciable, of more value than Jesus. Now, unfortunately, when he realizes how much trouble he got Jesus into, all of a sudden that money had no value to him, didn't it? Okay. But, but we look at this, and we look at this man who is pinching from the purse, the community purse, who's griping at a woman for anointing Jesus because the money should be, the, the perfume should be sold and, and the money given to the poor, meaning his pocket. And, and we see that when your life is controlled by money, it can't be controlled by God. All right. Then we look at Joseph of Arimathea who we know was a wealthy man. How do we know he was a wealthy man? His tomb. His tomb. <clears throat> Tombs were not cheap. They, they were in, in pretty high demand because people will die. You know, people were dying all the time. And he had a brand new tomb hewn out of rock and had never been laid in. We talked about the burial process and basically you had tombs that were just, just for... Lots of people. You'd prepare them. Their body would decay. You'd take the bones and you'd either put them in an ossuary or you'd put them in a pile in the middle of the room and then you'd lay the next person out. It's quite a business. But he had a brand new tomb. Now it says that he was a, a secret follower of Jesus. Now that it's interesting when you juxtaposition Judas and Joseph 
Judas is following Jesus. I mean, he's out there. He's one of the twelve. You know, he's not just a disciple of Jesus. He's an apostle. He's one that Jesus sent out with the message. And yet, he's got a false god in his heart. And then you have Joseph, who is a secret follower of, of Jesus because he doesn't want to get in trouble. He's a member of the council, the Sanhedrin, and he doesn't want to cause conflict there, so he's a secret follower of Jesus. But when it came down to it, when the test was laid before each of them, one failed miserably, and the other stood forth in bold proclamation and said, yeah, I want his body, and I'm going to take it, I'm going to put it in this new tomb that I had built for me. And so, here we have one that failed when it, his public proclamation is, I'm a follower of Jesus. But in his heart, his real proclamation is, show me the money. Well, then you have Joseph, who in, in his private, in his secret, he says, I'm a follower of Jesus. But when it came time, when it came that moment, he declared to the people, the very people that murdered Jesus, that they were wrong. And he did so not just in, in defying what they said, but he took the body of Jesus and put it in his own tomb. Now, we know that was public because how else would the Sanhedrin know where to put the guards? So at this point, when it came down to that point, one denied and the other proclaimed. Okay? Now, um, these, there's a couple points I didn't touch on last week that I want to share with you real quick. Because where Judas failed the test, <clears throat> Joseph passed the testimony. Okay? Now here's a man who had everything that you would want in life. He had possessions. He had prestige. He had a measure of power. And yet, he was willing to <clears throat> lay that down for something he considered greater than himself. Okay? And, and all of that wealth was a testimony to what he really believed, wasn't it? Now, you got to wonder a little bit. Uh, you know, it amazes me, um, because when you read through the Gospels, you think, how in the world did the disciples not know that he was, wasn't going to rise again in, in three days? He tells them repeatedly, I'm going up to Jerusalem to die. We're going to Jerusalem! Did he say to die? Surely he didn't mean that. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be handed over to the heathen. The leaders of the church are going to hand me over to the heathen and I'll, I'll be crucified. I'll be tortured and I'll be crucified. We're going to Jerusalem! Is he still talking? But you know, Scripture tells us that that's the case, that for a time, God blinds people's eyes. As a matter of fact, we see that going on today. <clears throat> we see people when the plain truth is laid before them, an apple is an apple is an apple. And yet, when they reject that truth, no matter how plain it is, it's not an apple. And they will go to the umpteenth degree to deny that that's an apple. Okay? So I believe that their eyes were blinded for a time. And I think that was done so they would know how desperately they needed God that they could not do things in and of their own strength. Because you look at these men, uh, Dr. Simon Greenleaf was a, a professor, I believe it was at Oxford. Uh, he was an atheist. And he was challenged by his classmates to do a trial on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they, they did this, he did it just like you would any other trial. He had the, the prosecution and he had the defense and he's reading all of this from Scripture. He's looking at external and internal sources, things outside of the Bible that reference Jesus, like um, Josephus and Herodotus, um, and he's looking at things inside the Bible. How do the witnesses that witness, do they all tell the same thing? And when he did this trial, he came to the conclusion that not only did Jesus die, but he had to have been resurrected. And that the leading reason for this was when Jesus died on the cross, what happened to the disciples? They're gone. They're cowering. They're hiding in the room. 
when Jesus rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven, you could not shut those guys up. They're beaten, they're stoned, they're scourged, they're executed, and yet their testimony never changes. This so impacted Dr. Greenleaf that he actually became a believer. He said all the witness, all the testimony points to this one truth. Because you are not going to die for something you don't believe. Okay? Now, <clears throat> it's a testimony. Is your money a testimony in your life? Is it something that you can, others can look at in your life and see what you believe? One other thing, money is a tool. <coughs> it's a tool. It's a means to accomplish an end. I'm reminded of the parable Jesus told about the wealthy farmer. And his crops were in such surplus that he didn't have room in his barns for all of his stuff. And so he built bigger barns. And you, you drive around the valley and you see some of these places that are being built. <coughs> um, I got to see uh, this, this horse palace <laughs> that is being built up here uh, just, just east of Stevensville. Um, I, we were, Steve and I were working here at the church on some plumbing and a friend of ours is, a, is an actual plumber and, and knows what he's doing and should have been here helping us. Um, but I got to go out and, and we needed a, a, a part to fix what we were working on and he said, yeah, just come on out and you can borrow mine. So I went out there and I'm looking at this place that they have for horses and I'm thinking, I could live here. <laughs> they, they got heat, they got cool, they got nice soft things to stand on and lie in and, and I could live here. And, and it's a bigger barn and, and so he takes his money and he builds a bigger barn and then it's an, evidently it's an impressive structure. And yet on the night of its completion what happens? He dies. Scripture says this very night your life is required of you. See, so what does it gain a man? What does it profit a man? To get everything in the world and yet forfeit his soul. See, it's a tool. It's something that God gives us to accomplish a specific purpose. But how frequently do we ask him what that purpose is? All too often we get money and we're just looking for the next goodie. You know? Uh, I remember when I was a, a child in San Diego, I found a dime. Now, kids today just go, Pfft. but a dime was huge when I was a kid. You could get lots of candy for a dime. Remember the farmer's market I talked about last week? Bazooka Joe. <laughs> and I had a dime, and my brothers wanted me to divide it amongst them, which them being older than I was, I didn't really think that between the three of us it was not going to come out evenly. But they wanted me to go to the gas station and ask the, the, the garage owner to, for change for this dime so that we could all have our own money. And I went in and, and the, this gruff uh, mechanic looks at me and like I'm an idiot. What do you need change for a dime for? Well, so I can give some to my brothers and <clears throat> we can go to the candy store. He said, why don't you just take the dime and your brothers and go to the store and just buy the candy. <laughs> you know mechanics are smart people. <laughs> <laughs> because that never crossed my mind. <clears throat> um, to this day, I, I don't remember going to the store. I don't remember what happened to the dime. Um, it was gone. But we're kind of like that, aren't we? Money comes in and money goes out. And, and that's one of the things that um, you 
will be taught in this Dave Ramsey class is that you have to de decide, you have to determine where your money is going to go because it will go. And if you don't have a place for it to go, if you don't earmark it somewhere, it's going to go somewhere that you just have no control of. Okay? So, <clears throat> it is a tool. It is a tool to accomplish God's purposes. We need to be asking the Father what he would desire of us for these purposes. Okay? So, now we're getting to today's message. Okay? So, <clears throat> Uh, I shared with you last week that this whole series came up as a result of my listening to James McDonald doing a series on money. And uh, <clears throat> when he shared some of his insight onto all of the passages of Scripture about money, now I'm a pastor. I went to Bible school. I've read through the Bible. I read through it at least once a year because I'm on a yearly reading program. But all told, I probably read it several times a year, but it's amazing to me how often you can read something and not really see what it says. Because when he talked about all of the different <clears throat> things that God had to say about money, and then he was talking about how many pastors preach on money and all they ever address are these few passages. And what about all the rest of them? And I was immediately <clears throat> convicted because when I look at money, <clears throat> the ones that jump out to me are the giving ones, my tithes, my offerings, my alms, okay? And, and all of the other ones I don't really pay a lot of attention to, but as he started teaching this series, it started opening my eyes to the fact that God has a very specific plan, very specific ideas on how to deal with money, all right? So today what we're going to talk about is how you get it, Okay? How you get money, how you acquire money, is very important to God. Okay? Um, before we get into that, there's something I need to, to share with you. Um, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Okay? Now, now, rightly handling, the, the Greek literally means to cut it straight. Okay? Um, rightly handling, thank you, <clears throat> the word of truth means that we need to look into it and we need to see what it says. Now, all too often, um, while, while I find chapters and verses to be convenient, I actually find them to be almost as much a hindrance as they are a help. Because we tend to live with this thinking that the verse is all. Okay? And we don't very often... I, I hear people quote scripture all the time completely out of context. And we just take a particular passage that we like and we apply it to what we think is an appropriate situation, not realizing that it had something to do with a radically different situation in scripture. Oftentimes I hear scriptures actually quoted in the inverse of how they're used in the Bible. And so rightly dividing, cutting straight, rightly handling the Word of God, as a, a minister, uh, when, when I teach, there are three methods that are, are typical among preachers. There's expositional teaching, okay? And that's where you take a passage, like we did a few years ago. We went through the book of Colossians, and we start at chapter 1, verse 1, and we work our way through to the end of the book. Okay, that's expositional teaching. We see what it has to say, and we look at that, we hold it up in light of what the rest of Scripture says, so we have a better understanding of what we're being told. Okay? Then there's topical expositional teaching. And, and that is where you, you take a portion of Scripture, and, and you look at it in light of, you know, the, just like you did when we talked about the gifts of the Spirit and the armor of God. We took a section out of a, a, a book and we dealt with just that section. Okay? Well, well finally, there's topical preaching. Okay? And this is what we're doing right now. Because there are topics in Scripture that are dealt with in multiple sources and there's not one complete picture in one passage. And, and we see this in areas like marriage. 
Okay? You want to find out what the Bible has to say about marriage, you got to look in a number of different places. You got to look in Ephesians, you got to look in Corinthians, you got to look uh, Colossians, you got to look in Revelation. There's, you, you've got to look all over. Um, eschatological, end time stuff. I gave you a $10 word. Eschatological, um, the end times. You've got to look in, in numerous places to see. What, what God's plan is, what he's revealed to us about what's coming. Okay? So, right now, we're doing a topical study on money. Because there's not one particular place where God has dedicated an entire passage to tell us everything we need to know about money. <coughs> so... Saying all of that to say this, when the danger that you have with topical preaching is that it's too easy to pick the verses that say what you want to say and to ignore the verses that don't. Okay? Um, this is, you can actually call this uh, inductive or eisegesis um, study because what you're doing is you have a preconceived idea, whether it be it's your own idea or you read a particular verse and develop the idea, and then you go back to the Bible and you find all the things that support your idea. Okay? And if there are things that don't support your idea, you write them off, you excuse them away, or you brush them under the rug. Um, some years ago, uh, we were listening to a series on... Um, health and wealth. And one entire message in that series was why all of these scriptures don't apply. And I, I'm listening kind of dumbfounded as this, this person that was teaching was taking all of these scriptures that very plain in their reading and their, their understanding don't really fit anymore. And what it came down to is because they didn't agree with what the teacher wanted said. And I, I thought, well, why are we making excuses for God's word? Um, Thursday evening, we are having our brothers meeting. This is our, our monthly brothers meeting. I'm making a change Thursday. I am actually inviting everyone in the congregation. Um, for those of you, I think Tim... Uh, so I, um, I, I watched a message by uh, Tony Evans um, on racism. This is a hot button issue with everything going on in the U.S. today. Um, so Thursday night, 7 o'clock, we're going to get together. I'm going to show that message in its entirety because he makes some significant points in that message that... that you, I, I kind of felt like, duh, why aren't we doing this? It, it was so obvious when I watched the message, and, and then I kind of stepped back and I went, what, why have we gotten so far away from this? And so Thursday night, 7 o'clock, we're going to watch Tony Evans talking on, on racism. This is the first time since I've been at the church that women have been invited to the brothers' meeting. <laughs> Feel free to bring cookies. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's that important. So Thursday night, 7 o'clock, um, we will probably meet in the back building just because this building gets so warm in the evening. We'll probably be back in the activity center. We'll get some fans going back there. We'll watch it on the TV over there. Um, now, I said that to say this. Um, one of the things that Tony shares in his message that really struck me, as a matter of fact, it struck me to the point where I stopped watching and I called Christy and told her, hey, put, put down what you're doing. I want you to come and listen to what he says. And he was talking about, <clears throat> we, we want to say, you know, we are, you know, I'm, a, I'm an American Christian or I'm a white Christian, or a black Christian, or a Chicano Christian, or, or whatever, and, and he talks about, I'm, I'm not sure that the words he used were actual words, <laughs> but they conveyed what needed to be conveyed. And he talks about how the, the descriptor, the adjective in this phrase, being white, 
or American, modifies the noun, which is Christian. And so the noun has to be adopted to the adjective. And so when you say you're a white Christian or you're, you're a, a Protestant Christian or you're a, an American Christian, Christian by definition, by the way you presented it, has to form itself into what you are claiming. Okay? And that's totally backwards from the way that God intends it to work. Because see, the Christian is supposed to be the adjective that modifies the noun that is whatever you are, whatever I am, and makes that change. Because I'm not trying to shape Christ into my image. The goal is that I will be shaped into his. Okay? <clears throat> so, with topical teaching, the difficulty we run into is picking and choosing the scriptures that we want to apply. All right? Now, I'm doing topical teaching, and unfortunately, because we have a limited amount of time, because some of us will die soon, <laughs> soon being relative to others of us. Dennis is going to outlive me. I have no doubt. Um, so I'm limited on time. Okay? So I'm not going to get to deal with all of these scriptures. We're not even going to get to look at the majority of the 270 instructional scriptures on money. But what I'm going to do is I, I want to break it down by subjects for each of those categories. <clears throat> we talked about whose money is it last week. It's all God's. Okay? So we have to have an agreed foundation, a shared foundation of understanding that it's not mine. It's not yours. It's God's. Okay? Now, uh, last week we talked a little bit about the parable of the talents. When the master was going away... He gave to the one servant five, and to the another servant three, and to another servant one. Now, what we don't really see is that those servants had to use that money, didn't they? The one that got five didn't just sit at home and leave that five sitting on the counter and go out and work his tail off and bring five more in. No, he took the five and he invested it. He used it in order to gain more. Okay? So what I want you to understand from this is I'm not saying that you don't get to use the money, the things that God has given you. You just got to be careful in what you use it for. Okay? God is expecting a return. All right? So, and that covers all areas of your life because what do you have that you did not receive? If you can walk, God did that. If you can think, God did that. If you can enjoy food and tell when there's onions in it, God did that. Okay? So, so we need to be cautious. We need to have new thinking in how we handle what is not ours. So let's look uh, at a, a couple of things here. Um, turn to Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs actually deals quite a bit with money, and, and I think it's appropriate... Because who is the writer of Proverbs? Sorry? Solomon. Solomon. What do we know about Solomon? Yeah, he, uh, when he became king, God told him, he said, ask of me what you will. And Solomon said, I would ask that you would give me wisdom that I might rule your people properly. And God said, all right, because you didn't ask for wealth, you didn't ask for prosperity, you didn't ask for all these things that other people want, but you asked for wisdom that you might lead my people. He said, I'm going to give you the wisdom, but I'm also going to give you all the other stuff. And so uh, at one point I, I did the math. Now this was several years ago. Um, trying to figure out how much gold that uh, was brought into Solomon, what the worth would be today. And, and keep in mind that we're, we're estimating on the talents and we're, we're trying to, to catch up with things that their weight might have been a little different than what we understand. But, but the number I came up with it was $1.7 billion 
a year. Okay? This was, and this was just his. This was not what was coming into the country. This is what was coming into Solomon. Okay? The, the country had so much wealth that people were throwing away silver because it had no value. They were, oh, you kidding? You got five silver. I got 500 gold. Get rid of that stuff. Nobody needs that. Okay? So, one, Solomon was blessed with wisdom beyond other people. Two, he was blessed with wealth beyond other people. And, and I think the one kind of helped the other, but both of them obviously are a blessing from God, right? So when we're talking about the wisdom of the Proverbs, we understand that it was written by a pretty smart dude, right? Okay? Um, the guy knew what was... I mean, people from all over the world were sending their learned people to Solomon to learn. And he had so much wealth. I mean, he had lions cast in gold on the approach up to his throne. So when he talks wisdom, and he talks wisdom about money, um, it's something we perk up and we pay attention to. Now, before we read this passage, there's something I need to share with you. Because a lot of times we misread Scripture because we're reading it with wrong intent. Scripture is broken down into a number of types. Okay? Proverbs is what we call wisdom writings. Okay? Psalms are poetic writings. We have prophetic writings. We see um, Revelation. We see a lot in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel. Um, we, we have historic writings where they're telling us what happened at a particular time. Um, and, and when we look at Proverbs... All too often, when we look at Proverbs, we read a, a, a passage of wisdom and we take it as a, a, a personal promise to us. Okay? And, and really, a lot of times, I don't think that's what's intended. Solomon, in his wisdom, he's writing down the things that he has observed in life. As a matter of fact, if you look in Ecclesiastes, you see he observed a lot, don't you? And, and what he's writing down is, is these are the things that most often happen. Okay? For example, when he says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. He's not speaking that as a promise that, hey man, if you get him to Sunday school every Sunday, they're going to be a preacher. Okay? Well, what he's saying is that generally, the rule of thumb is if you raise them properly, you will have well-behaved adults. Okay? You teach them the word. When they get older, they're going to remember the word. Um, this, uh, I, I read a biography a number of years ago, and I just had his name, and it just escaped me. It was a, uh, uh, his last name was Zechariah, or Zechariah's. Uh, he was shot down in Vietnam. He was a pilot, and he was put in one of these little, small, you can't even call it a room. It's basically a doghouse. And he and the guy on the other side of the room, they would tap on the wall and they'd pass mass messages back and forth in Morse code. And they would pass it all the way down because it was a strip of like 12... It wasn't even a cage. It was, it, there was not room enough for him to stand up nor lay stretched out. Okay? And, and what he said was, you know, he had not been in church since he got out of his mom and dad's house. But when he was growing up, his parents made sure he was in church every Sunday. And the guy next to him was a Mormon. And between the two of them, they were amazed at how many scriptures they could remember. And they would tap to each other scriptures to encourage one another. And they'd pass it down the row. And then they'd pass another one back. And, and those things that he had committed to memory as a child came back to him as an adult. Now, the observation is, if you do these things properly, the, the end result is most likely going to be good. But it's not a guarantee, is it? Because how many people do we know that have done everything that appears to be right, and then when their child came of age, their child chose to go do whatever they did. And some of them, they, they man, they went deep 
they wandered far. You know, uh, the prodigal son. This is a man that believed God. And yet when his son came of age, he took off and he did everything that he was not supposed to. Okay, so it's not a promise saying that, you know, if you do it all right, I'm going to take care of it. And now, I believe that it's a revelation of God's heart. Okay, and I believe that there's a special place in the prayers before God, those prayers that come up as incense before God for a mother's cry for her son or daughter or a father's cry for his son or daughter, that that, that is a special place for God and, and that receives special attention from him. But it's not a guarantee. It's an observation of normalcy. Okay? So when, when you read Proverbs, first understand that what, what Solomon is speaking out is the general outcome of a particular circumstance. Okay? So Proverbs chapter 13, <clears throat> um, verse 11, says, Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Now, um, the the word, does anybody have something else that says wealth gained hastily? Does somebody have a different translation that reads different in that? Dishon yeah. Dishonest. Dishonest. Money. Dishonest. Money. Yes. <clears throat> Vanity. The, the, the Hebrew word there is help. And, and the word literally translated is like a, a mist or a vapor. But in the application, in the context in which it's used, it, it comes up as vanity. It's something that appears to be there but really isn't. Okay? And, and so a, a better translation is, is actually going to be like um, dishonestly or, or vainly. Okay? So, I'm sorry? Mine says fraud. Fraud. That's another good one. Because what it what it's saying is not that you know you you know money comes in real quick, although that carries true as well, uh, but it's more how you get it. It, it dwindles quickly. Um, I read a biography. Um, does anybody know anything about the Newton Boys? There's actually a movie on it too. Uh, Matthew McConaughey plays in it. The Newton Boys uh, were. Uh, uh, group of brothers, there were uh, at least three, there might have been four, I remember three. Um, they were living in the Great Depression. Uh, two of the brothers broke horses for a living. Uh, the other brother uh, went to jail. Um, no, actually it was a fourth <laughs> because it was the oldest brother that got the younger brother in jail. Um, and they robbed banks for, for over 200 banks were robbed. Um, and I remember at one point, they robbed over $100,000. Okay, now you divide that up uh, between the four of them, and there was one other guy who actually helped plan the robberies. You divide that up, and, and you're looking at $20,000. Well, we look today, we go $20,000 doesn't last a whole long time. Well, you're talking about the Great Depression. You're, you're talking about a time when a shirt cost you a nickel. And, and, you know, you could get a steak dinner for 25 cents. And yet within a matter of time, usually about a month, they would be out of money and have to go rob again in order to sustain the, the lifestyle that they were living. Now, God is very concerned about how we acquire the things that we acquire. And I'm stopping right here. Darn it. Because there's, there's a, a bunch of things that I want to share with you, but I want you to start thinking this week. Okay? I want you to start looking through Scripture. I want you to open your eyes. Don't necessarily change what you're reading, but pay attention to what you're reading in the Word. And I want you to start noticing the times that God starts talking about money. Okay? I found... Well, actually, the James McDonald said he found 88 scriptures. I found 72 that, that deal with specifically how you get money. Okay? So, I'm still searching. He didn't give me all the scriptures. So, I'm, I'm still looking. 
But if God put it that many times in his word, and it's got to be that readily apparent to us, unless it's one of those things we just kind of go flatline, you know, when you're reading, and you get to a part that you've read before, and your brain just goes, ee, oh, that's new. Okay? I want you to pay attention as you read, and look at those scriptures. Look at the ones that deal with money. Look especially for the ones that tell you how you get money. Okay? We just looked at Proverbs 13, 11. We're going to talk about that more in depth next week. Amen? Amen. Okay. Whose money is it? God. God. It's a test of what? Integrity. Self-control. Self-control. Love the people. Love of people, work ethic. love of God, thank you, work ethic. Okay? It's a test. When you get money, every time you get money, every time a paycheck comes in, it might be signed by employer.inc, but it is coming from heavenly.father. Okay? So, stick with me. I had planned this to take six weeks. Right now we're up to eight. All right. Uh, also, pay attention. Coming up, um, Orange Day. We're going to interrupt money for Orange Day. Ben, stand up. Dun, dun, dun. Um, we are going to wear orange. We're going to meet outside. We're going to take a day. We're going to remember our brothers and sisters that are being suffering, they're persecuted. All I, I read a report this week. Uh, five churches a week are burned down in Nigeria alone. Five churches a week, okay? That's just Nigeria. So we wear orange so that we remember the, 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 remember the orange jumpsuit that ISIS made the Christians wear when they beheaded them. We want to uh, stand with our brothers and sisters in Christ that are suffering. The word says that when one part of the body suffers, it all suffers. And when one part of the body rejoices, it all rejoices. So when we see that those that were taken captive are set free, we rejoice. But we also, we remember those that are still suffering for his name's sake. Okay? You can that pitch. <laughs> Father, we bless you. We bless you today. We thank you, God, for your word. I ask, Lord God, that you would open our eyes, deepen our understanding, Help us, Father, to see more than we have, to understand more. Father, you say that wisdom is ours for the asking, and we ask, Lord God, that you would give us wisdom. And I pray, Father, especially with money, with all the, the, the wrong teaching that this culture has given us, I ask that you would show us right teaching. Father, that you would show us that when we come to you, we become disciples. We live a disciplined life. And we only can do that through your spirit enabling us. So I ask, Father, that you would, uh, this week as we read your word, you would open our eyes to see those scriptures, to have a deeper understanding, a richer understanding of your word. We bless you today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.